Welcome to today's webcast brought to you by Military and Aerospace Electronics Online. Today's event focuses on thermal design in military embedded computing applications. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics Magazine, and I'll be your host and moderator. Today, we have two distinguished presenters, Brian Muzika, Sales Manager at Advanced Cooling Technologies in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Scott Garner, Vice President and Manager of the Electronics Products Group at Advanced Cooling Technologies, who will join us for questions and answers. This presentation is live and interactive, so you can submit a question at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question button in the presentation window. After our panelists give their presentations, I'll open it up to questions from our online audience and for discussion among the panelists. First, a couple of housekeeping details. If you are running pop-up blocking software such as the Google Toolbar, you will need to disable it to view this webcast. In addition, we recommend that you close down all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. Additionally, the audio portion of this presentation could be available as an MP3 download. A reminder email message will be sent to, your, sent to all registrants with a link to the archive and will also be accessible from the home page at www.militaryaerospace.com. So let's get started with Brian Muzika of Advanced Cooling Technologies. Brian? Thanks, John, and thanks everyone for joining us. As John mentioned, please feel free to type in questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to a couple afterwards, and any that we don't get to during the presentation, we will answer in the next couple of days uh, via email. We're going to get started with a quick overview of the presentation. We'll start with an overview of military embedded computing followed by a brief background on heat pipes, describing the technology and the enhancements they can have to the military systems. We'll then look at an overview of the thermal path and hit on each major point along the path, which includes heat spreaders for electronics cards, the attachment of the card to the chassis, and the card guide or chassis itself. Finally, we'll wrap up the presentation and take any questions you might have. So in general, military electronics face a lot of demanding challenges. Many of these challenges are coupled with the thermal design of the system. The most notable thermal challenge is the temperature requirement. Military systems must be able to operate in very hot ambient temperatures up to or even exceeding 70 degrees C. This is coupled with the limiting factor of electronics that typically have a maximum case temperature between 85 and 100 degrees C. This creates a very small thermal budget for design engineers. Harsh environments create additional challenges, including the need for ruggedization. Systems must be able to handle shock, vibration, and other various elements um, regarding harsh environments. Military Standard 810 outlines a lot of the thermal requirements in military systems. These systems can be deployed on mi mission critical um, jobs and need to be durable, effective, and reliable. Also, because most systems are on mobile platforms, there's a need for lightweight solutions. The popular SWAP acronym is vital in thermal systems, as size, weight, and power are all key areas of design. Today, we'll talk mostly about embedded computing systems, although the principles and design considerations are applicable across any electronic system. In embedded VME or VPX systems, the electronics board is attached directly to heat spreaders, which move the heat outward toward the chassis. The edge of the card is attached using a card retainer, usually known as a wedge lock. This allows for easy assembly and quick servicing or replacing of the electronics boards. This connection transfers heat to the card guide or chassis, which then dissipates the heat with either liquid or air to the environment. For liquid-cooled systems, the liquid is typically located at the base of the chassis, while air-cooled systems have fin stacks surrounding any hot areas of the chassis. The thermal load, ambient conditions, and available airflow or liquid flow will typically determine the dissipation method. Now, 
Now in this figure, we'll look at the thermal challenges of a typical system. The figure here shows an air-cooled chassis with a single card being slid into the card guide. The first thermal challenge we outline is spreading the heat along the card frame. Typically, the card frame are aluminum for its weight and thermal properties. If improved heat spreading is needed, copper is an option, but this will add weight to your system. As we continue to explore options that don't add weight, <clears throat> um, we'll get into high K plates, which stick to similar weight as aluminum, but thermally outperform them greatly. The next critical point is the wedge lock. At this location, we'll discuss in more detail coming up, <clears throat> it, it becomes a thermal bottleneck of the system due to the large thermal resistance network. Heat is disproportionately spread into the chassis, which causes um, a great temperature rise. A standard wedge lock will have nearly 80% go through the card frame directly to the chassis, and only about 20% of the heat go through the wedge lock. This creates large temperature rises in a relatively short thermal path. The final area we'll look at is once heat enters the chassis. Again, here it relies on co conductivity of the chassis to move the heat um, to the ultimate heat sink. In liquid-cooled systems, you need to move the heat to the liquid, which is typically isolated at the base of the chassis. Um, it's usually located here to prevent any leaks um, isolated from your electronics. In air-cooled systems, the idea is to spread heat to maximize your fin efficiency on those, on those uh, fin stacks. Now that we've outlined the system, we'll investigate improvements um, from normal systems. The focus in these solutions are heat pipes. We'll begin with some background on the technology and then continue to demonstrate their effectiveness in these type of military systems. Heat pipes are a passive two-phase heat transfer device. They utilize the lane heat of a fluid to very effectively transfer heat across the lane. Looking at the figure in the top left portion of the slide, the evaporator area will be placed beneath your heat generating electronics components. Heat is gathered and input into the heat pipe, <clears throat> which caused the fluid to vaporize. The vapor then moves along the center of the heat pipe to a cooler region passively due to the inherited pressure gradient. At the colder region, the fluid condenses back to a liquid. The liquid is then pumped to the evaporator using a capillary action provided by a wick structure. Overall, a heat pipe will have a two to five degree temperature rise across the length of the heat pipe. They can be used by itself or in conjunction with other metal components to increase system performance. Anytime conduction is a limiting factor in a system, a heat pipe should be considered. In the case of embedded computing, moving heat to an external heat sink is a great example. Due to the densely packed cards in these systems, there is no available room for local heat sinks, which creates fairly long conduction paths. The increased conductivity with the heat pipe solution leads to isothermal surfaces, which allow for lower electronics temperatures. The biggest benefits are exactly what military electronic systems are looking for, swap. Heat pipes can decrease the size and weight of the system with more effective heat transfer. Also, by lowering electronics case temperature, you can pack more power into your system for increased capability. The final benefit we have listed there is also a, a fairly important one. Heat pipes are very versatile. They can be bent and flattened within your system. This allows for retrofitable designs, which save a lot of cost and time um, that a full system redesign may incur. <clears throat> this is a critical part of embedded computing systems because the electronics layout and the stacking of the boards and the dissipation method is typically unchangeable once you go down a certain path. The figures we have shown here represent good examples of the benefits. In the top figure, um, heat pipes are laid into available real estate of a 6U VPX card to move heat from the electronics to the edge. Uh, we'll go deeper into car card cooling a little later, but it's easy to see how the heat pipe can easily be integrated for large thermal benefits. The bottom figure has a heat pipe taking waste heat off the hot side of a thermoelectric cooler. There wasn't room right at that, at that junction for a large, large enough heat sink, so the heat pipe moves the heat away from that area to a space where you have more volume.
Now you have a little background on heat pipes. We'll look at utilizing the technology in an embedded computing system to increase performance. Uh, we're going to start with a quick review of the overall thermal path. The example here, again using the same example in the top corner, will serve as an illustration of the thermal path. The primary areas of concern um, are labeled A, which is the conduction cooled cards, um, B, which is the card chassis interface, and C, which is the dissipation off the chassis. In this case, it's using convection to air. The first resistance within the card is moving heat to the edge with conduction. This is a fairly straightforward, um, but also a critical component nonetheless. At the board chassis interface, the card has a parallel resistance network moving heat into the chassis. In one path, heat travels directly to the chassis from the card with a simple interface resistance labeled here as R2. In the other direction, the resistance network consists of R3, which is the card and wedge lock interface, R4, which is conduction through the wedge lock, and R5, which is the wedge lock and chassis interface resistance. Um, because of this uh, resistance network, it's a big reason why the, you have maldistribution of heat going into your chassis and also have that thermal bottleneck at this interface. Finally, at the location C, the heat must conduct through the chassis as shown in R6, and it must be dissipated off the sidewall um, for air cooling in R7. If the chassis were liquid cool, R6 would be even more vital as a component, as we'll discuss a little later. You'd be basically moving the heat all the way down to the base, and then R7 would be along the bottom surface there. Now we'll look at heat spreaders for electronics cards. And we'll look at some typical options, and then we'll talk about high-K or embedded heat pipe solutions to increase performance. Again, to reiterate the thermal path in this section, we'll be looking at the spreading along the electronics card frame. These card frames rely solely on conduction to remove the heat. The basic challenges, as most are aware, is the increasing power in the boards, such as CPUs or FPGAs. Cards need to have a thin frame to fit into a tightly packaged chassis, which makes the thermal solution even more vital. These frames typically attach to the card guides with a wedge lock. One of the ways to increase heat transfer into the chassis is making sure that the card edge has fairly even heat distribution. Having a concentrated heat load on one edge can cause issues down the thermal path. As I mentioned before, aluminum is most common for its combination of weight, cost, and thermal and mechanical properties. It has a thermal conductivity of about 180 watts per meter K. The next option that most designers look at is copper. In this option, you sacrifice weight for thermal conductivity. Copper has a thermal conductivity of about 400 watts per meter K, but is over three times more dense than aluminum. The solution we'll be discussing in detail is embedded heat pipe frames, or high-K frames, which has a thermal conductivity ranging from 500 to 1200, depending on geometry. It also has weight similar to aluminum, as we'll get into. So continuing with high-K plates, um, high-K is a term for high conductivity, talking about plates embedded with heat pipes. Um, they take the isothermal properties of heat pipes and embed them into standard aluminum plates with either an epoxy or a solder joint to increase the overall conductivity of the plate. The heat, the heat pipes are strategically placed to get good thermal results while not affecting current geometry or mounting services that you might have in your system. Overall, the heat pipes with the solder is similar to the weight of aluminum, which makes the overall plate weight similar to aluminum. So the result is a plate that is the same size, same geometry, same weight as aluminum, but has the conductivity nearly three to five times greater. These plates can be used as structural components as well within the system. To illustrate the conductivity value, we'll look at the design in the bottom right corner. This plate had various high power electronic components mounted to it, resulting in several hot spots. So as you can see here with this thermal image, the original aluminum plate had hot spots up to 91 degrees C. <clears throat> this was obviously greater than the desired case temperature of the system design. 
So we looked at embedding heat pipes and coming up with a high case solution to reduce those hot spots significantly. Um, in this case, the ultimate cooling was liquid cooling along the rail, um, and the board was attached with wedge locks into that cold rail. Looking at the figure to the right, you can see that the overall um, result, the design reduced the temperature by over 20 degrees. You can also see the benefit of routing heat pipes along the rail, which is a big driver in these conduction cooled boards. In the figure to the left, you can see concentrated hot spots on the top that are fairly close to the liquid cooled edge. By simply using heat pipes to move the heat horizontally to the edge wouldn't cause a large benefit, but by routing the heat pipes along the cold edge, the heat flux at the condenser end is lowered, which results in large thermal gains. So now going back to the application of conduction cooled cards, the challenge here is to design the layout to create a cost-effective, thermally enhanced design within a thin frame. <clears throat> with uh, ACT designs, we have gone as thin as 1.83 millimeters with a proprietary embedding technique that still allows for a transfer of significant levels of power. Design engineers should be cognizant of the importance of spreading heat not only to the edge but along the edge as we discussed in the last slide. A final note is the electronic standoffs and mounting features can be avoided when routing heat pipes. Heat pipes can be placed from either side, which will not affect those critical standoffs to get your heat into the frame and avoid large resistances with pads or greases. So the next section we'll be looking at is the card to chassis interface. What we'll do here is investigate the current methods and the new ACT dual condenser design to enhance the card to chassis interface. We'll wrap up the section by showing some comparative tests of several approaches to illustrate the performance gain. Again, looking at the um, thermal resistance network, you can see there's a large number of resistances for a short thermal path um, associated with the wedge lock connection. The car is attached into the chassis with the wedge lock. The thermal resistance network through the wedge lock, shown on the bottom of the parallel resistance ne network, is much larger, which creates that poor distribution as we discussed before. The resistances R3 and R4 are attributed to thermal resistance at the card wedge, <coughs> at the card to wedge lock metal to metal interface and conduction through the wedge lock. The proposed solution is to eliminate these resistances by moving heat directly above and below the wedge lock. This will allow for a near 50 to 50 split of the heat entering the chassis and lowers the overall temperature rise at this interface. So to accomplish this goal, the proposed concept is referred to as a dual condenser high K plate. This is similar to a high K conduction cooled card, except the heat pipe extends out of the plate and integrates, into a <coughs> integrates the condenser end of the heat pipe into a movable condenser block. The nature of thin wall heat pipes allow for this repetitive movement, um, the small repetitive movement of attaching the condenser block to the chassis. So what will happen is the wedge lock will then slide in between the condenser block and card and it'll still be used as the mechanical force that presses the condenser block tight against the chassis. Since the heat pipes are transferring the heat above the wedge lock, there is no need for heat transfer through the wedge lock, which creates a large thermal benefit. A similar mechanical attachment uh, to the chassis is achieved with this design as compared to a normal wedge lock design. So now to validate this concept, we set up a repeatable test using a standard aluminum conduction frame, a high K conduction frame, and the dual condenser high K conduction frame. You can see the heat pipe layout in both the high K and the dual condenser high K. Um, the goal, again, was not only to move the heat to the card edge, but also isothermalize that area for better transfer into the chassis. This slide looks at the test setup um, that we ran. The setup was basically designed to mimic how a card will result in a real system. We laid heaters in towards the center of the card and we took overall thermal resistance measurements um, that measured the delta T from the points shown in red here. Um, thermocouples were placed beneath the heater and in the heat sink itself. So then 
once you get those temperature readings, you divide the delta T by the total power and you solve for the thermal resistance. So we ran one at this setup and we also looked at the interface resistance, which are shown in blue here. Um, these will account for basically the interface resistance through that, car, or through that wedge lock interface. So here's the graph for overall thermal resistance. You can see there's a big jump um, just by going to a high K solution and spreading that heat along the edge of the card. This creates a uniform um, interface for the wedge lock and drives down overall thermal performance. If that's not enough, going to a dual condenser design will shave even more temperature rise off your system by further reducing that interface resistance. Now, if we're just looking at the card to chassis interface, you can see the benefit of the dual condenser design. There were large gains at this interface by going to a, a high K, um, but even much more significant by going to the dual condenser high K. So going from a standard aluminum plate to a dual condenser can save over seven degrees at 80 watts. Um, and that's just this interface alone. So that's a very small portion of the overall thermal path. Sorry about that. So the final step is looking at the card guides um, or the chassis itself. So here represented in the C, um, circled in this figure, is what we're going to be looking at. And we'll be looking at both air-cooled systems and liquid-cooled systems for the chassis. The two primary methods that we've been going over are air and liquid cooled chassis. In the liquid cooled chassis, the conduction within the chassis down to the liquid base is the primary design consideration. Um, when your current framework is not thermally conductive enough, there are a couple options to allow for quick fixes, um, which include implementing heat pipes directly into your chassis or card guides, or using an exter external bolt-on high K plate to increase conduction with no changes to your chassis. Um, the second method is air-cooled chassis. Here, the main design consideration is spreading heat to gain fin efficiency and add surface area. Um, just as important in this design is making sure your fins are properly um, designed. <clears throat> as a general rule of thumb for this, a first step is to make sure you have enough fin volume to meet your temperature rise goals. From there, you can optimize the sizing and spacing um, by looking at your airflow or if you're using natural convection. Um, then you can look at the conduction gradients and see if you, there's a need for a high K plate or any further um, integration for, to increase your conduction along the surface. When going to a, a high K plate, you get better fin efficiency by getting a more isothermal uh, surface underneath the fins. So I mentioned this briefly, but this is a look at a bolt-on design high K plate. So what we're doing here is the bolt-on high K plate will take heat and move it rapidly in the direction of the heat pipes. So when you're using this um, for a liquid base cooled application, for example, it'll greatly reduce your conduction gradients <clears throat> and is a relatively easy thing to integrate onto your system. It requires no changes or redesign of the chassis itself and it's a relatively straightforward process because you're basically using straight heat pipes to move the heat down. To demonstrate the, uh, the additional benefit of a bolt-on high K plate, we simulated a six slot system, um, six slot card guide. The breakdown of power is shown to your left and if you take a look at that, you can see there's a cluster of high power components in slots three, four, and five. For this analysis, we used a liquid coolant temperature of zero degrees, and the goal was to limit the temperature rise to less than 35 degrees. This is just an overview of our comparative analysis. We used equivalently sized bolt-on plates for the comparison of aluminum versus high K solution. In the high K solution, the heat pipe integration is fairly simple from a design and manufacturing standpoint. It basically uses straight heat pipes and moves the heat from the electronic slots to the base very effectively. 
And this is the result of the thermal simulations we ran. Looking at the hotspot temperature in each case shows a 61% improvement from the baseline aluminum to a high-K solution. The resultant temperature rise decreased by over 50 degrees C from 82 degrees C to 32 degrees C. For a retrofit design that keeps design costs low, the resultant thermal gain is pretty massive. Now here, similar to a bolt-on high-K design, um, this is a integrating heat pipes into the car guide itself. Um, with the heat pipes accounting for the heat transfer, oftentimes you can reduce the weight by decreasing the thickness of the car guides. As I mentioned earlier, the solder integration and heat pipes combine for approximately the same weight as aluminum. Therefore, any bulk metal that you remove is approximately the amount of weight you would save. Um, so going back to the analysis we ran in the figure before, if you were to achieve the results on the right um, with bulk aluminum, you would add two inches to the thickness of the plate, and that would account for over five pounds of weight to your system. And a lot of times these systems are set up with multiple car guides, chassis, and, and slots, so you can really reduce your overall weight by, by considering this type of approach. Now I'm going to quickly wrap up, and then we'll take some questions. Um, as an overview, some, some things we, we hope you learned a lot, um, benefits from high-K solutions. Um, but to summarize, first off, military electronics are increasing in power. There is little way around it. Even as the electronics get more efficient, the demand for increased capabilities continues to drive higher powers on electronics boards. Thermal management is often at times a limiting factor with the ambient temperature and environmental concerns associated with military designs. Um, with a small thermal budget, designs must be as efficient as possible. So to achieve those efficient thermal designs, high conductivity or high K plates should be considered. They can benefit at all locations along the thermal path, including increasing performance in the conduction cooled card frames, the card frame and chassis interface by removing resistances associated with the wedge lock, and also at the card guide or card chassis itself. So these solutions also provide customers with size, weight, and power advantages over a lot of similar options. Again, we thank you for joining us, and now we will be taking any questions that may have came in. Okay. Thank you, Brian. And as he said, now it's time for questions and answers and comments from our audience. Uh, Scott Garner from Advanced Cooling Technologies will join us to uh, answer some of the questions. So um, we've got uh, we've got quite a list of questions here, and the first one is, how much power was on the module presented in slide 15? Realize you'll probably have to go back to slide 15 for Can that. Just a second, we'll pull that slide up and see which one we're discussing. Yeah. Okay. Um, this was a this was a large board, so this wasn't a standard three or six shoe board. This was about um, 18 by 12 inches, roughly a very long. Uh, uh, wedge lock joint to liquid cooled chassis, and I think this was dissipating somewhere in the park of uh, about 400 watts total power into this. Again, double sided heat input into that high K plate. Electronics were mounted on both sides of that uh, conduction card. Okay. Um, another question we've got is Does ACT work with DARPA TGP heat pipes? Or type heat pipes? Yes, we were very active on that program. Uh, we, we were uh, funded through DARPA to investigate uh, CTE matched, and, and the whole goal of that program was to uh, TGP stands for thermal ground plane. So to integrate almost within the card itself a plane, just like you have an electrical ground plane, a plane that can be tied to a constant temperature and just cool electronics regardless of where they're placed. Um, we handled, we designed a uh, ceramic vapor chamber assembly that handled very high heat fluxes on that program. We were partnered with UCLA and University of Michigan, and um, there's information on our website regarding that program for anyone that wants to dig a little farther. Okay. Or we can talk about it. All right. Um, another question. Uh, can heat pipes still be effective when designed into a 3U or 6U induction frame that gives access for one or more mezzanine cards? 
Yes, um, absolutely. It's just a matter of how you couple the, if you're trying to pull the mezzanine part itself, you need to somehow couple that to the conduction frame, which is, is pretty typically done anyway. Um, and if you're just cutting out the conduction card for access to that mezzanine board, as you can see from some of the, um, the uh, hardware in the presentation, we route heat pipes around cutouts, pedestals, pads, uh, mounting holes, et cetera, in these standard conduction cards. So it's very flexible in the overall design. Okay. Um, now, can you please re-explain or, or, or perhaps, you know, uh, just cast some more light on how to eliminate R3 and R4 with um, dual uh, conducting high K plates. Yes. Um, so if you go, Brian's going to pull up the slide. So if you look at, um, can you see your mouse? Look at the. Uh, they can't see the mouse. Okay. If you look at the um, schematic in the center of this slide, you'll see the conduction card coming in, and and tying to the chassis. And the wedge lock provides the force to mechanically attach that to the chassis and lock it in place. The bulk of the heat comes through the card and goes through R2. To get the heat out to the other side of the chassis or that large area up top, you need to go through an interface to the um, wedge lock itself. You need to conduct the heat through the wedge lock and then a second interface between the wedge lock and the chassis. By using heat pipes to pull the heat over, and if you click to the next slide, in this one, you can see the red is the wedge lock, and the heat pipe comes off the conduction card and goes to the top of the wedge lock and is in direct contact to the chassis. So this splits the heat between conduction at the bottom and the heat pipe pulling its share of heat to the top, and the wedge lock is no longer in the thermal path. So those two resistances are eliminated, and heat flows equally into both sides of that chassis slot. Okay. Um, um, what is the cost impact using dual condenser high K for six U cards? I mean, it, it's certainly going to be more than a standard machined plate, but uh, for the thermal benefit, it's certainly a, a cost-effective option. It's going to depend on the number of heat pipes, the design configuration. Um, we also do quite a bit of secondary work, plating, helicoil installation, EMI gasketing. So it really depends, you know, to give an exact price is, is challenging uh, in this format. Okay. Um, I've, got a, I've got a question about spray cooling, and, and that is how does uh, your technology uh, compare to direct spray cooling, and what would be some of the design trade-offs and considerations? It's a very different beast. Um, spray cooling involves obviously much more complex systems. You need to spray directly onto the devices. You need to collect that. Um, this is a passive system. Heat pipes can be integrated and bent to existing geometries, and um, there's no moving parts other than the wedge lock, which is in there anyway. Um, so I would say overall, um, it's much more passive, much more uh, integratable into existing configurations, and uh, you don't need to worry about, it's also more reliable, you don't need to worry about pumps, and um, that's kind of a contrast between the two. Right. Well, yeah, and I have, I have a question myself that, that, that's come to mind is, it seems to me that, you know, um, electronics engineers, when they're, when they're designing, uh, you know, when they're designing, typically just think of, okay, I'm, I'm just going to be a conduction-cooled system, or I'm just going to be a forced air system, or I'm just going to be a spray cool, or just a, you know, liquid flow-through cooling, or, or even, you know, uh, exotic air conditioners and things like that, but it seems like it's it's all you know putting all eggs in one, into one basket. And you know, if I was if I was looking at your presentation correctly, it seems that you know perhaps sometimes a better solution is to look at how we might blend some of these technologies. And you know, do you, in the industry, when you're talking to your customers, 
do you see some of that same, you know, some of that same mentality of I'm only going to be conduction cooled, I'm only going to be air cooled, I'm only going to be liquid flow through cooling, and you know, without consideration to, you know, how you might blend some of these technologies? Yeah, sure. I mean, the goal the goal typically is to do it as passively and as minimally invasive as you can. So if your your electronics are of low enough power that you don't need anything other than conduction, that's the way to go. Um, if you're looking at air cooled or conduction cooled or liquid cooled chassis and you're having issues um, getting the heat from the components on the board out to the edge of the sidewall, um, this may you know the high K plates are certainly an option, and we're seeing them. Um, being integrated and used across industry. Um, and what I think it allows you to do is it, it allows you to go to higher powers, higher heat flux devices, which everyone's pushing limits on, without integrating either spray cool or liquid cooling in the board itself, which is always a reliability risk. You know, if you have a leak, then it's in your electronics. Whereas if you're liquid cooling your chassis, you have a leak, your electronics are protected. What these heat pipes do is allow you to move the heat from your device out to your liquid cooling, which is in the chassis, and it allows you to run higher power components without converting to that uh, flow through or spray cooling on the board itself. Okay. Um, what is the effect of different surface platings on thermal conductivity? Minimal. It will pr would have more of an effect at the interface and that's also small, but conductivity is through the cross section of the metal. So if you have a, you know, a tenth inch thick aluminum conduction card, whether you put a through few thousandths thick layer of nickel on it, that's not going to have a big impact in the conductivity. It would have more impact at the interface, and that's usually also very small, unless you're using a coating like um, anodization, which has as a, a even though it's thin, it is a ceramic and it has a slightly uh, higher impact on the thermal resistance. Okay. Um, does gravity significantly impact performance of heat pipes? Does it have any influence? Yeah, it can. You certainly want to design the heat pipe or your end solution to a function and have sufficient margin in, any, in the worst case orientation. You know, a, a four millimeter heat pipe that's six inches long may do 50 watts fully gravitated, where it only do 30 if it's fully against gravity. But if you design it for 25, then you're safe in any orientation. So it may result in the addition of one additional heat pipe, but you always want to make sure you design it for worst case operating condition, and then you're safe in all other uh, orientations. Okay. Uh... Got a time to development question here. What is the time frame uh, to develop a custom dual condenser high K type system or plate? Um, it, it varies obviously with how far along the design is and, and uh, how much prototyping and testing is required. Typically we'll do about a week, work with the customer for a week on design and analysis, finalizing requirements, and um, then finalize the mechanics. So that's thermal analysis orienting the heat pipes, laying them out, matching the components, how many do we need, uh, and where they will lay in. Then maybe an additional week to finalize the mechanical drawings of the components. And then it's typically a six to eight week development time depending on the number of plating operations or how much secondary mechanical features we add to it. Okay. Um, I've got a, a fairly involved question that involves uh, slides 29 to 31. So as I'm asking the question, if you could perhaps bring those slides up. Sure. And the, the question is, what is required in terms of number of bolts uh, at the bolted interface between the chassis and the bolt-on high-K plate? Uh, so that the bolted interface does not become a bottleneck. And really the question specifically is what was assumed in your example uh, of around slides 29 to 31? Um, we built these for customers, and it really depends on the interface material you're using and the heat flux that's going through the wall. The good news is once you spread it out over that chassis, it's not a very large heat flux. It's the same amount of power, but it's spread over a much larger area. 
So when you drive it into these cards uh, and down, it should be a somewhat lower heat flux. I'm not sure what we used in the analysis specifically. I'm assuming probably a standard um, gap pad material and with some bolting force. Those interface resistances are a function of pressure, so it really depends on the interface material as to how many bolts are required, obviously, but um, you, we certainly account for that in the analysis and the models. Okay. Um, I wanted to remind our online audience that you certainly can ask a question. We've got a little bit of time left. If you'd like to ask any questions of uh, Brian or Scott, just uh, submit the question by clicking on the Ask a Question button. Um, I've got a question here. Do these, uh, do these function over a wide temperature range? I mean, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of range are you talking about with your technology? Yeah, certainly we, we provide these primarily to the military market, so we're working with military temperature ranges from minus 45 to plus 50 degrees C typically. Um, the heat pipes and almost all of these are copper water heat pipes, so the fluid will freeze below zero, but when it's that cold out, you usually don't need the enhancement associated with the heat pipes, and just conduction through the metal itself is more than sufficient. Uh, the fluid in the heat pipe is contained in the wick structure, uh, which is, has a very low modulus and acts as a sponge. So when you do freeze, there's no mechanical damage to either the pipe or the assembly in any way. And as soon as it warms up above zero, they'll start functioning and transferring heat uh, efficiently. Well, that, you know, that, that kind of raises a question in my mind, and it, and, and it has to do with, you know, the operating conditions and operating environment. Do you ever or often run across um, uh, customer situations where, um, you know, that something, a system could be operating in a relatively cool environment that in some conditions might require more exotic cooling, but since it's operating in a cool environment, maybe up in Alaska or something, that you can get by with um, uh, fins and heat pipes and things like that rather than something more active. Is that, is that ever a consideration? Sure. If, if your solution has a known fixed position and it's somewhere far north or uh, that, that the temperature never gets up to the high end of those military specs, that's always an option to design around that. Uh, a lot of what we do is they, they don't know the end use. It's a, it's a, a vehicle of some sort, ship, airplane, uh, ground vehicle, or even if it's fixed electronics, they're not sure where it will be deployed in the world. So we always have to design for typically that worst case high end ambient. Okay. Um, I've got a, qu a question and a comment here. It says, this, this may sound simple, but is there a strategy to develop a, the thickness of a simple conduction cooled plate? What are the considerations there? Yeah, if you're relying on pure conduction, and you have a high gradient from your high power device that's maybe located towards the center of that plate, um, you can do finite element or straight conduction analyses to determine how thick you'd need it to move the heat from that component to the edge where it's cooled. Um, and that's using straight conduction equations for either aluminum or, as Brian said, copper has better conductivity, but it has a mass penalty. Um, what you can see from some of the information in the presentation when we integrate heat pipes, it allows us to maintain very thin, lightweight aluminum structural components and get the benefit of embedding the heat pipes so we get much higher con effective thermal conductivities. And if you're just playing around in your model and you throw a conductivity in of aluminum, which might be just under 200 watts per meter degree K, you can go to, uh, and you want to see what embedding heat pipes would do, you can throw a value of 600 in there. And that should give you a good ballpark of what we could accomplish by embedding some heat pipes into that system. Okay. Um, now, for your for your high K plates, what are they typically made of? Um, is, is there a wide variety of materials to consider? Or are they typically just made of one type of material? Most often, because we get the thermal benefit, we don't need to use copper, and we use aluminum, which saves the the weight in the end system. And uh, we embed copper water heat pipes either through soldering uh, or epoxy. Okay. 
Do you see a great deal of difference between the performance of a three-piece wedge retainer versus a five-piece wedge retainer? Yes, there is, and it's also the difference between the quarter inch and three-eighth. They have various thermal performances for the variety of different designs. Okay. Um, I've got a re reliability question here. What is the life cycle of your heat pipes or, you know, in terms of mean time between failures? Yeah, that's a difficult question. There's a reliability guide on our website that we have. Um, we don't have good mean time between failure data because we just don't have enough um, failure to, to put a solid number together. Typically, typically, if there are issues in the field, it's, it's mechanical issues um, from some of the secondary things, either plating or helicoil screws, things like that. The heat pipes themselves are very reliable, particularly copper water assemblies. It's the most proven heat pipe material system, and there's um, life tests and reliability data um, all over the place on, on those systems. Okay. I wanted to remind the audience that uh, we still have a little bit of time left. If you would, if you would like to ask a question, any kind of question uh, of our two panelists, Brian and Scott, you can you can ask any question you'd like just by uh, clicking on the Ask a Question button. Um, and so, and they would be happy to uh, happy to uh, answer those questions. Um, one here says, "What's the nominal heat pipe diameter?" being used in embedded heat pipes? Mostly what we're doing in uh, 3U and 6U conduction cards is going to be either a 3 millimeter or 4 millimeter diameter heat pipe. However, we typically end up flattening that into the plate itself. Uh, the, thin, the thinnest assembly we have to date is just under 2 millimeters, about uh, 0.072 inch thick assembly. Um, that's very tight. Typically, they're more on the order of a tenth inch or above in these aluminum spreader plates, and we flatten the three millimeter heat pipes to fit within that uh, web thickness. Okay. Um, a question I have is, in terms of the in terms of the technology offerings that ACT is has on the drawing board, I mean, what can what can we expect from ACT in terms of you know any imminent uh, technology announcements, and where do you see particularly heat pipe technology going in the next, say, uh, two to five years? I mean, what, what kind of technologies and capabilities and cooling will we see in the not-too-distant future versus what we have now? And, you know, with those new technologies, what types of, you know, capabilities would you expect, particularly in terms of, you know, some of the new microprocessors like the fourth generation Intel Core i7? I mean, what uh, what's on the horizon? Well, I think one of the things that everyone's looking at is thinner, higher power capability heat pipes, um, custom wick designs that have increased pumping capability so you can handle uh, higher powers and smaller footprints or higher heat flux into the device itself. Certainly it was touched on with the thermal ground plane concept that DARPA put quite a bit of money into and funding. I think there's been some great um, strides forward in that technology. Um, CTE matching of the heat pipes and vapor chamber assemblies themselves where it has the same coefficient of thermal expansion as the electronics so you can do a direct die attach. Um, increasing that TIM1 interface, uh, things like that. If you go to our web page, we have a very broad and diverse uh, scope of technologies that we're working on. Um, way too much for me to go into any kind of detail here, but feel free to go to our web page, click around if you have any questions on any of the technologies there. Um, we'd be glad to uh, discuss them with you in more detail. And the URL, URL to your web page is what? www-1-act.com. One at, at one okay, terrific. Um, I see that we don't have any additional questions. Um, is, there, is there anything that you would like to say to wrap up, or is there anything that I or the audience has really forgotten to ask that's most pertinent to uh, 
uh, embedded computing cooling. No, we appreciate your questions and we appreciate everyone's attendance. If anybody okay. has any questions uh, later on, feel free to shoot Brian an email and uh, we'll certainly be in touch. Okay, and is your is Brian's email address, uh, what is that email? Um, my email, if yeah, if you go to the last slide, it's, it's my name, Brian dot Musica, um, so you can get that information there, and I believe that's also on the Military and Aerospace website, and it's at one dash act dot com, just like our website. Okay, all right. Um, so, um, on behalf of Military and Aerospace Electronics and Penwell, I would like to th thank Brian Musica. Sales Manager at Advanced Cooling Technologies in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Scott Garner, Vice President and Manager of the Electronics Products Group at Advanced Cooling Technologies. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours, and you can access it from the homepage at www.militaryaerospace.com. Um, uh, and and I'm sorry, the, uh, a reminder email will go out to everyone who registered for the webcast, uh, which will give you access to an archive that has the presentation, so you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to review these presentations and have those for your files. Um, so we thank you for joining us today. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics. Thank you very much.